Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. Recently I just dropped part 2 of episode 1 of Wally and R2-D2 Home Journey, an ongoing Wally and Star Wars fan series featuring Wally and R2-D2 going on an adventure. Making it was quite the adventure itself, and today I want to talk about it. So here is how I made Wally and R2-D2 episode 1, part 2. So I guess I should start with some background. What is Wally and R2-D2 Home Journey? Well, it's my crossover fan series I'm making all by myself featuring the titular characters Wally and R2-D2, where R2 and his Star Wars companions get attacked by a Star Destroyer, which sets R2 to crash on Wally's Earth and meets <gasps> Wally! Who would have thought? From there, the two journey across Earth to find the last rocket ship to get R2 back to the Rebellion, all while being tracked down by the Empire and their mysterious hired agent. Now you're probably hearing that and thinking, Wow, that sounds like quite the concept, McDowell. Why on dystopian Wally Earth would you start a project this ambitious? Good question. Because I felt like it? If you want a longer answer, I guess it really started back in late 2018. Yes, I remember the year. When I first got my Amazon Prime account. Before, I would have to beg my dad to buy me stuff online. But now with my own Amazon account, I could buy whatever I wanted. Even equipment and materials for sets for my movies. I don't remember why a Wally and R2 crossover specifically crossed my mind as a project, but later on I found an old Wally figure I had from 2008, and that made me think, wait, I have this figure, and I could buy an R2D2 model kit from Amazon? Whoa. So I immediately got to work. I started with figuring out the storyline for the whole series, and of course, I settled on a buddy action-adventure series themed around home and family. Inspired by stories centered on such themes like The Hobbit and The Odyssey, I then began writing the script for Episode 1. Now, when you're writing a story, especially in the early stages, it can be a really awkward process. Originally, I wanted Episode 1 to start with R2 and the gang doing a search and rescue of a rebel ship that led them to Earth, only to discover the wreckage of this ship that was attacked by the Star Destroyer that would send R2 down to Earth. I later figured that was too complicated and would require me to figure out how to achieve some wreckage models. After many revisions, I settled with the current plotline of them finding Imperials from hiding after the first Death Star blew up. As I was writing Episode 1, it dawned on me that this was going to be a BIG project, which is why I resorted to releasing this episode in parts, and then when it was all finished I would re-release those parts as the full episode, if and when it's ever finished. Soon I finished writing Episode 1 in its entirety, after which I began writing the future episodes. As of the release of this video, there are three fully written scripts for the first three episodes, each ranging from 40 to 60 pages long. Jesus Christ. I then moved on to building the Earth City set from part one, and let me tell you, that set was a pain in the butt. Because I'm not very skilled with construction, these sets can usually take me half a year to a full year to build, which is another reason why these videos take so long to make. But using my new Amazon account, I bought all the necessary materials such as tool, glue, tape, bendy wire, and other stuff, and saved the cardboard boxes as my building materials. Very advanced, I know. <laughs> For planning my sets, I usually go by the image I have in my head or rough sketches, and not so much from detailed blueprints. However, if it's a specific set from the movies, like the Millennium Falcon sets, I collect reference images from the internet and construct my sets from those. I build my sets out of the cardboard from the Amazon boxes, cutting up pieces into specific shapes, and then glue or tape them together into the set. With all my sets, I make it so I can remove the walls or little parts as much as possible, so when animating I can more easily access the characters and not have to worry about my hand not reaching or fitting into the sets, or blocking my view of the process. Once the structure is complete, I paint all of the parts using a combination of spray paint for bigger pieces like the set walls, and handmade painting for smaller pieces or more detailed designs. And when that's done, I incorporate wires, buttons, and some levers to act as electronics. They don't actually do anything, they're just meant to add more detail to the sets, as well as something for the characters to interact with. After all of that, the set is considered finished. Whew, finally finished all these sets I built for my movie over the past two years. Glad I don't need to build another one. Alright, let's see what the next scene is. Aw, oh, shit. Now before any animation can be done, I still need the voices for these characters. Because I do this all by myself, I of course do all of the voice acting. Reading off the scripts I have written, I record all my lines on a toner TC777 USB microphone, and unlike a PROFESSIONAL audio artist, I cut, assemble, and edit all my lines in Final Cut Pro. I know, I'm so not like other audio editors. Please think I'm cool. After the lines have been assembled into a radio cut, I export it into an audio file. 
with my new full audio of all the edited lines together, it is finally time to start the stop motion animation. Just behind building the sets, animating is the second hardest and most time consuming part of making this episode. It is because of how tedious it is that I originally wanted to film the scenes with people in live action to cut the production time in half. But since I couldn't find any actors or figure out how I would mesh the live action and animation decently, I resorted to making it all animated. I animate using a combination of different figures. For Han, Luke, and Chewbacca, I use the Bandai SH Figure Arts action figures as they are the most well-articulated and accurately sculpted and painted representations of the original actors. Even if they are a bit creepy looking. Don't worry about that, we'll fix it! But we won't be able to if you just stand here and let them tear us to pieces! Meanwhile, I use the Bandai model kits for R2-D2 and C-3PO. For R2, I specifically use the Rocket Booster version as that's the kit with most of the gadgets and tools he uses in the movies. Such as his iconic di- uh... Universal Computer Interface arm, his spy camera, and his rocket boosters. As for C-3PO, well, he's shiny. Like, really shiny. Like, wow, you can really spot the green screen on him. With all the characters assembled, I proceed with animating on Dragon Frame at 15 frames per second using a Nikon camera. You'll notice a lot of the animation consists of slight movements of the arms and head, with a lot of still freeze frames in between. Being a novice animator, this is a technique that helps ease the animation process. In the beginning, I actually didn't animate with Dragon Frame or an icon camera, but instead used my iPhone on a crappy stop motion app. That's how the Wally opening in part 1 was animated. However, it became apparent that animating on a phone was tedious, the app I was using was absolutely horrendous, and the animations themselves came out way too janky and rough to be usable. So on my birthday, I switched to Dragon Frame, got the Nikon camera, and reanimated all the scenes there. Except for the Wally opening, I'm saving that for later. It was in the iPhone era that I was animating the characters with cutout mouths syncing with the words the characters were saying. Good. I could use some good news right now. But not only did that impede my animation process, it also just really didn't look good at all. So when I switched to Nikon, I scrapped the mouths and went with the characters going mouthless, basically. To compensate for the lack of lip syncing, I had the characters incorporate exaggerated body movements such as waving their arms and tilting their heads to punctuate their lines. I can't contact the rubble base. The computer won't let me send out a signal. They're simple, minor additions, but it helps keep the characters somewhat alive and expressing their emotions. The animation gets really tricky when the characters are standing up, especially in a tight space like the cockpit. To prop them up, I attach blue tacks to their feet and stick them onto the floor. The results are hit or miss. Because the figures are really small, and also because I really don't like the screwing them to the floor method fight me, I have to constantly battle making sure that they stay in place and not fall down. Otherwise, I have to reanimate the whole scene all over again. This happened on multiple occasions. Okay, so as I was animating this, uh, this is supposed to show the process of Han Solo falling down, but because the thumbtack doesn't support uh, Han Solo's weight or hold him there properly. He just fell down like this the farther back he went and it just really makes makes it harder harder to animate these characters while they're standing up. So uh, yeah, that's my life as an animator. So I try to avoid doing as many standing and walking scenes as much as possible. But after all the frustration and mental breakdowns, the animation is complete and then it's off to the most fun but just as tedious part of production, the green screen shots. Of all the aspects of production, the green screen shots are by far my favorite. Instead of animating in stop motion, I film miniature ships in real time against a green screen where, depending on the demands of the shot, I either move the camera, the model itself, or even both to give the illusion of the ships flying through space. In fact, this is how they did it for the original Star Wars movies in the 70s and 80s, when they built models and filmed them against a blue screen to be composited against space or other backgrounds. In my production, none of the models are built by me, but are collected from a strategy board game called X-Wing Miniatures Game, with the exception of the Star Destroyer which came from the Armada series. These board games utilize movie-accurate miniature models as their game pieces, which were the perfect props for what I was achieving. I actually have quite a history with this style of filmmaking. A few years ago, I played around with the effect with some test shots and side projects, like redoing and adding some clips to a JonTron skit, and the Millennium Falcon vs. TIE Fighter video that you can still watch on my YouTube channel. I even attempted a short film entirely in this style titled Blue Hero. 
which I submitted in my application to the film program CISA, but that's a story for another time. One of the most complicated green screen shots in the episode thus far was recreating the Millennium Falcon swaying to and from the camera, which would require me to build a contraption that would allow the Falcon to rotate left and right from its front. This was built out of a Death Star cannon mock I previously built out of Lego, which has a knob connecting to gears inside, allowing a central rod protruding from the top to spin around. I covered the mock in green paper to match the green screen, along with painting the central rod green. After that, I built and painted a small attachment out of Lego that would be super glued to the Falcon model, allowing me to attach it to the rod and detach it to reuse for other models. When all was said and done, I let the camera roll, turn the knob a few times over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until I get the perfect take. With all my green screen shots, it is time to edit them. Compared to the earlier process of production, this is by far the quickest and most fun of the process. Nothing is more satisfying than fixing up the colors, keying out the green screen in place of a more interesting background, and adding in the sound and music when they work. I do have trouble fixing the colors of some of these scenes into something that would be pleasing to the eyes. In fact, I had to recolor the first minute of this episode's part because I didn't like how orange it ended up looking. And because these editing projects took up so much storage space on my laptop, and I was an idiot for deleting them and not saving them on an external hard drive, I had to re-edit that entire first minute from sound design to green screen while fixing the color. It was not fun. Save your projects on large external hard drives, guys. Moving on, I also incorporate some space shots in this part, which are again inspired by the original trilogy style of filmmaking at that time, and are a technique that's very near and dear to my heart. To demonstrate, I'll be showcasing the Millennium Falcon flyby using the green screen shots I had previously recorded. On Final Cut Pro, I put down a plain background to be used as a placeholder, in this case the stars. I then scour all the Millennium Falcon shots I had made until I find the perfect take, which I then add on top of my background. With that set, I key out the green screen and color correct the Falcon. In this shot, I also have the Star Destroyer underbelly to put into the background and have the camera move across so when editing, it'll look like the Falcon is speeding underneath it. With all of my green screen shots in place, I then make the background more interesting by adding in other elements such as Earth and the Sun to make it less barren. And since this takes place over Wally's Earth, I make sure to include the satellites cluttering the Earth's atmosphere. All of these in the stars are animated by keyframing them to move across the screen. I also keyframe the Falcon to further make it move farther or closer to the screen to make its movements even more dynamic. The shot is almost done, and now it's time to add in the finer details, the biggest of which are the green lasers the Star Destroyer fires at the Falcon, giving swift motivation for the Falcon swaying so intently. I make these lasers from a plain green generator that I mask into a long teardrop shape, give it a glowing effect, and turn down the opacity halfway. These are of course keyframed to slip across the screen very fast towards the Falcon. For the finishing touch, I add a lighting effect to put a shadow on the Falcon and the Destroyer. This is made with a spot effect that I place on the sun to add more lighting to the Falcon along with its shadows. As the Falcon moves around blocking the sun, I darken up the effect to simulate the sun coming in and out of view. With that, the shot is finally complete. For the sound department, I use a combination of sound that I made on my own and sound that I found on the internet. The music was really interesting because it was actually the first original soundtrack I composed myself on GarageBand. In Wally and R2-D2 Part 1, I used the music from other artists. But then that video got copyright claimed, so I decided to try my hand at making my own music. It took me a few tries to find some good melodies and make sure they matched the edit of the film. But when put together, I think it worked really, really well. <laughs> After all of that, the video was finally, FINALLY finished and ready for YouTube. Depending on how many scenes there are that take place in different sets, these parts usually take me some years to make. Part 1 alone took me two years to conceive, build, animate, and edit before it got on YouTube. It is frustrating, and it takes me so long to make these, and being in community college certainly doesn't help make it go faster, which is why I have been in such long hiatuses. And since I'll be starting four-year college soon, it makes me a little worried about the future of this series and my YouTube channel. However, I accept that I will probably not finish the series as I envisioned it, or really this pilot episode in its entirety. 
and instead I just want to make it for fun and grow my skills. If all else fails, maybe I'll post the finished script somewhere online just to get the story out to people. Whatever happens, thank you for checking out my channel, my series, and being interested in how I made this one-man project. It's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. If you would like to keep up with the status of the project, I just put up a Twitter and Instagram page where I'll be posting updates on Wally and R2-D2, which will include future behind-the-scenes snippets, my life updates, as well as some other side projects I decide to do. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I even attempted a short film entirely in this style titled, 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 duh. A few years ago, I played around with the effect with some, uh, yeah, the more I do it, the more I screw up. Okay. When I built models and filmed them against a blue screen, I almost said green screen. Uh, <coughs> oh, gross. <coughs>